Hello and good morning uh, to another uh, activity of the Abdalinha Ao Vivo series. I'm Miguel Oliveira, and today we are going to have a conference by Alexander Berger. Uh, so Alexander Berger joined the Institute for English and American Students at Osnabrück University, Germany, in 2006, when he became full professor and chair of English language and linguistics. His research interests include, among other things, language variation and change, historical social linguistics, and constructional approaches to languages. His works include several authored and edited books, um, as well as more than 50 papers in high profile international journals and edited volumes. He has taught at the University of Dusseldorf Bonn, Santiago de Compostela, Wisconsin, uh, Milwaukee, Catania, Vigo, etc. And he has organized numerous international workshops and conferences. Today, he's going to talk about historical sociolinguistics in Coleman's bathtub, re revisiting the micro, macro link. Thank you very much, Alexander. Thanks for having me. Thank you very, very much for your kind words. And uh, good morning, good afternoon all around the world. I'm, I'm very excited to be here. It's a great honor and a pleasure. And uh, I hope I don't hit any wrong buttons and cut you off, but let's hope for the best. Uh, now let's try if I can share my screen with you. Okay, here we go. Uh, so my topic for today is Coleman's bathtub and the micro macro link. The micro macro link is actually um, a very, oh, hang on a second. Here we go. It is actually a very old problem in linguistics and it's very simple. The question is how do the individual language users, the speakers relate to what we call the language. So what about the single speakers of English? How do they relate to what we then call English or French or whatever? And the bottom of that, it would be the microlink, the individual speakers, and we have the languages as the macro level. And the big question is how does the micro feed into the macro and how does the macro in turn influence the micro level? That's a very old question and Enfield has already worked on that quite a bit. And it gets even more complicated when we look at language diachrony. Uh, that's what you see here. So on the one hand, we have speakers of Old English like King Edward, for instance, and we have Old English as a language. And then we have Queen Elizabeth and of course, Modern English as a language. Old English as a language evolves into Modern English and whatever King Edward was saying somehow transform into what Queen Elizabeth is saying these days. So same problem essentially, but slightly more complex since we have to keep in mind that we're now moving through time. And today I would like to suggest that Coleman's bathtub might be an answer to that problem. What is Coleman's bathtub? Coleman's bathtub basically uh, is what you see here. It's a bathtub and this is uh, James Coleman, a sociologist from the University of Chicago um, who wrote a very, very influential big book. Uh, I've got that here. So that's like a, a brick of a book. It's called Foundations of Social Theory in which he developed uh, a model of social dynamics and actions. And I'll show you in a minute why it's called Coleman's bathtub or some people call it Coleman's boat, same thing. So I will, re I will be referring to Coleman's bathtub and Coleman's boat um, interchangeably. Why is it called a bathtub or a boat? That's what you see here. That's the diagram from Coleman, the famous diagram. It looks a little bit bathtub shaped or boat shaped if you like. And it has the macro level, that's the system of action or the society level or the level of organizations if you like. And then below that, you have the micro level where you have the individual actors and the resources. Uh, and Coleman tried to relate these to each other by using these several links. And I'll give you one example of how he's doing that in sociology. 
One of the most famous examples he uses is his analysis of Weber's study of the link between Protestant religious doctrine and capitalism. Weber in the early 20th century said that Protestant religious doctrine leads to capitalism. And the big question for many people was, how is that possible? How does one system feed into another? And Coleman's analysis suggests that as a first step, on the macro level, there is Protestant religious doctrine, which leads to certain values on the micro level, certain ideas. So for instance, the hardworking person, the person who saves money, the person who's very strict and very meticulous about things. So all these are values that are maybe fostered and, and encouraged by Protestant religious doctrine. So that's the first link from macro basically to micro. So now we're on the level of the individual. These values of the individuals lead to certain economic behaviors, right? So if you're very hardworking and you're saving, well, then, then you're saving money basically, and you value the hard work of other people. And you probably think that hard work needs to be rewarded and not working needs to be punished, for example. So the values on the micro level lead to certain behavior on the micro level. That's the second step. As a third step, then, um, we see a collective behavior. So all the people who share these values basically um, behave in roughly the same way. And this, in turn, feeds again into the macro level as a third step. So we move from micro to macro again, and we get a system of capitalism. Because if everybody is basically uh, behaving in a capitalist way, well, then ultimately, we have a capitalist society. And in that way, we automatically get a link on the macro level again between Protestant religious doctrine and capitalism through the detour, if you like, of the micro level and the individuals and their values and behaviors. Although nobody, and that's the important point, wants to develop capitalism. That's one of the essential things that there is no goal-oriented behavior in the sense that the individuals want to create capitalism, but the individuals just behave according to their values and they behave in a certain way on the micro level. The macro level itself doesn't have that sort of teleology or that, that goal. Another example uh, from Coleman is about revolutions. That's the same idea, uh, so we can be quick here. Um, Coleman, in a very provocative um, approach, says, well, certain social conditions, and for him it's improved social conditions, not worsened social conditions. So certain social conditions lead to particular frustration, for instance, on the level of the individual. So let's say the whole economy is getting better, but a certain group is being left behind or doesn't, doesn't profit in the same way from that improvement as the others. That creates frustration on the micro level. This frustration on the micro level in turn leads to certain behaviors, right? For instance, aggressive behavior. And if that aggressive behavior accumulates again and leads to collective behavior, then we might see something like a revolution. So again, one social system develops into another via the link of the micro. So summarizing, uh, Coleman's bathtub or Coleman's boat, we see that, okay, we have social facts or institutions or systems. In a first step, these provide conditions of individual actions, values, factors, constraints, etc. Then we have changes on the micro level as number two, and then collective action number three, again, leads to certain outcomes. That, in a nutshell, is the idea from social theory developed by Coleman. Um, he has three more components, as he calls that, and we're going to need them too uh, before we now turn to linguistics. Obviously, the first component is the macro to micro component in the sense that we, the system somehow needs to uh, influence the individual, the micro. Then we have the individual action component on the micro level, and then back again, micro to macro. So individual behavior feeds into bigger systems. And we're now going to look at each of them, each uh, of these three components from a linguistic point of view, and let's see how, how that works. We'll start with the macro to micro component. And the question I think that's relevant here is what sort of constraints 
and motivations does the linguistic system, which I would identify as the macro level here. So linguistic systems as macro, how does that system impose uh, certain constraints, motivations, et cetera, on the individual speakers who form the micro component? And I would suggest that there are two types here, at least two types. On the one hand, we have something like universal communicative goals and constraints. And on the, on the other hand, we have something like system internal constraints and factors, analogy, grammaticalization, et cetera. And these form step number one. So how about these universal communicative goals and constraints? The first thing that comes to mind for me at least would be something like Keller's uh, Maxims of Action, which he identifies in his famous book on the invisible hand in language change. Um, basically he says there is one universal maxim or one universal rule, um, talk in such a way that you are most likely to reach the goals that you set yourself in your communicative enterprise. And then he breaks down this hyper maxim into eight individual uh, maxims. So number one is talk in such a way that you're understood, talk in such a way that you are noticed, talk in such a way that you are not recognizable as a member of a group, talk in an amusing or funny way, talk in an especially polite, flattering and charming way, talk in such a way that you do not expend superfluous energy, talk like the others talk and talk in such a way that you are recognized as the member of a group. You notice that some of these maxims are contradictory, but this is because in particular situations, you want to follow one or the other. So if you're rooting for a certain football team and you realize that you're, um, you're meeting opponents uh, from the other team, then you don't want to be recognized as a member of the group maybe, but if you're among your own team members, well, they want to sound like them, of course. So it depends really in which context you are. And I would suggest that these are fairly universal systems, uh, fairly universal factors that influence our linguistic behavior. And I wanna pick out one in particular, and that's the talk in an amusing, funny, noticeable way aspect, because this is something that we see all the time in language history, but also in present day English. So here's one example. When you look at the use of because in present day English, you see in number one and number two, these are the regular uses that we all learn at school. So we have because and a prepositional phrase, and we have because and a clause, because of your language, because he's so troubled, no big deal, no problem at all. But then we also see instances like three, four, and five. Uh, motivations alone, motivation alone does not assure success because circumstances. Eat veggie burger, finish this one, but only because famished. Tayun is so lucky because goddammit. These are not uses that you would learn at school, for instance. These are unusual uh, structures, of course. And I would, I would suggest that this is something that people do intentionally uh, to be funny and amusing and to have also certain pragmatic effects that go with these particular constructions. So this is one way how speakers intentionally relate to Keller's maxim and want to be funny or witty, for instance. And that's the same, for example, six and seven, also from present day English. After the health plan disaster, I feel completely comfortable. Not. So this is something that's very popular among younger speakers, of course, this, this post-sentential not basically. It has certain pragmatic effects that come with it. But using it is something that you do when you want to be noticed as somebody who's very hip and very witty and interesting. And the same thing for structure in seven. Hey, racist much, this, this post adjectival much uh, is also something that people use when they want to be funny. So here we see a universal constraint that goes back to, to Keller's maxim. Another universal constraint in language or another universal pattern or mechanism in language, very old, very famous, comes from Hermann Paul's study on sound change, of course, and I'm sure many of you will, will remember that, that Paul basically says that when we're speaking and we use our muscles, our the muscles in our throat and our mouth and so on and so forth, it's basically like trying to, to hit the bullseye with bow and arrow. Right, So we're trying to, to hit that perfect goal, to hit that perfect phoneme, phone, if you like, 
uh, but it's clear that we can't always hit it, right? So we're missing one way or another. And the point is that we're all not missing randomly, but through various factors that have to do with, econ uh, with the economy of speaking, with phonetic factors, with social factors and others, we're hitting in a particular direction. Um, so we're all off to the right top corner, for instance, and that gives this sound change a certain directionality. And that's then ultimately what we see in big, big sound changes like the great vowel shift here in English, where all the long stressed vowels basically between 1300 and 1700 get raised by one position and the top vowels get diphthongized. This is something we can explain, of course, when we look at Powell's model, but also when we look at the ideas of having gaps in the vowel trapezium. All these would be universal linguistic factors uh, that we can, we can use here. Another universal pattern that we see are, of course, Kurilovich's pipes and gutters and, uh, to go with that, Manjak's tendencies. So this is about analogy in language change. Analogy is a very general cognitive mechanism that we all have. So it's a fundamentally human capacity and we're very, very good at it. Uh, the point is that in language, of course, we don't know quite when analogy will strike. So certain analogies work, other analogies don't work. But the point is that as soon as we get analogy, Mm, we know how it happens. And Kurilovich said, this is basically like pipes and gutters and rain. So you never quite know when it will rain, but if it rains, we have pipes and gutters that tell us where all that water will flow basically. And Kurilovich and Manjak suggest that um, there are certain laws or tendencies that tell us that if there is an allergy, particular things will happen. I brought you two examples here. So this is Kurilich's law number one, which says that a complex morphological structure tends to replace a simpler morphological marker, not the other way around. Example comes from German, uh, Old High German and Modern High German. Um, we have the singular gust and the plural gesti. Um, and with boom, we have boom and boomer, tree. Modern High German has Gast and Gäste, and Baum has Bäume. The interesting thing now is that uh, Gäste leads to Modern German Gäste, basically through I mutation. So the word final I leads to a shift in the, in the previous vowel in the R, so the R turns into an E, into a slightly uh, more fronted vowel here. But that's not the case for Baum. Uh, if you look at the old high German Buma, um, there is nothing that conditions um, I mutation. So theoretically, we should have modern high German Baume, not Bäume. Uh, but Bäume actually is what we have. And this is because uh, we find analogy, uh, analogical patterns here, for instance, to Geste. And we see that we have two morphological markers here, the umlaut and the word final E to mark the plural here. Um, so that's Kurilovich number one. And second example is Kurilovich number five. If a language has the choice between losing a more important grammatical distinction and a more marginal one, it will give up the marginal one. And that's an example from Latin and Iberian. So in Latin, we have panis, panis, uh, panem and panis in the Accusative and in Iberian, we see a leveling here. So we only have the singular accusative pane as a distinct form left. And in later Iberian, uh, this spreads uh, throughout the singular. Now in early Iberian, basically we had a choice. We could either level the, uh, the case distinction, um, and have uh, pane pane, that's what we see in later Iberian. Or alternatively, we could level the uh, singular plural distinction and have pane for accusative singular and plural. And apparently uh, Iberian here choose to level the, um, the case distinction rather than level the um, number distinction. So it can be argued that number maybe was more important here than um, than case in this leveling process.
One more example, famous example, of course, uh, about factors in language change that give us a certain directionality for speakers that help speakers basically, or that, that guide speakers in their linguistic behavior is grammaticalization. There's been libraries full of books on the unidirectionality of grammaticalization. So the development of less grammatical material to more grammatical material and ultimately to zero. Uh, one example that we see here is the de development of ne pas in French. So we start with single ne. This then gets reinforced uh, by another by another word pas in this in this case. So we have not a single step. Then um, we get true term negation. So pas loses this meaning of being. Uh, of, of step and rather becomes a part of the negative pattern. Then the negation ultimately is exclusively transferred to pa and ne is lost and we, are, we end up with pa as the sole negator. And it's kind of obvious that um, once we reach pa, we cannot go back in time and reintroduce the, the ne. So in that sense, grammaticalization is of course unidirectional and has certain very well-defined pathways that we can find that speakers use and that speakers go down. Another famous example, of course, from grammaticalization is, is this going to pattern. So we start with the physical action of going to London. Then we have a purposive clause, going to visit Bill. Then we have reanalysis. So B, going to is seen as one unit. Then this unit combines with main verbs which are incompatible with go. Then we see an increase in frequency and ultimately also something like univerbation into Ghana. And again, this is something where numerous scholars have described uh, very clearly definable pathways and patterns, this unidirectional pattern that speakers can follow. So these will be examples, I think, for the macro to micro level. So how these macro structures, these linguistic systems, social systems, communicative systems uh, have constraints, factors, predictable influence on how the, the micro speaker um, acts. So now let's turn to the individual action component. Uh, so what happens on the micro level from the individual action uh, or from the from the values that we had by basically to, to, to concrete actions. And here Coleman introduces a distinction between expressive action on the one hand and purposive action on the other. And I think that's also something we could we could consider in sociolinguistics and in language change because it's a very interesting thought. Let's begin with expressive action. Um, expressive action is something that Coleman defines as a reaction towards something. So if you think about the, the frustration, for instance, that you get with social conditions, this is, this is an expressive thing. Uh, it's not something premeditated or goal oriented. It's something that you do as a reaction towards particular things. And uh, one example I think comes from the change in the pronoun system from Old English to Middle English to present day English. So in Old English, we had the plural pronouns uh, he, here, him, and he. Um, in Middle English, we had a mixed system because we have the borrowed form of they from Old Norse and the genitive, dative, and accusative first remained, uh, as you can see here, with initial age and then also adopted the interdental fricative. So here turns into there, hem turns into them, and the accusative hem also turns into them. In present day English, of course, we've lost all the H forms and we only have the TH forms, they, their, them, and them. So there was a gradual replacement. And I think it's obvious that this is not something that you do intentionally or with a goal, um, but it's something we can explain very nicely by subconscious patterns as expressive action. One of the first suggestions comes from Traeger in 1967, who said that we might try to analyze the present day English pronouns into single morphemes like a, like a nominative part and an object part and so on and so forth. And if we do that, as you see here, roughly in the middle, then um, uh, you could have something like an analogical pattern. 
So they, uh, as a nominative, relates to them, basically, and they in the nominative relates to their, so you form analogical patterns. The problem here is, as Mühlhäusler and Harry point out, that uh, these, this idea of a morpheme is very ill-defined, is very problematic, leads to a number of questions. And we're also left with the question, what do we do with other pronoun forms like we, for instance? Are there also sub-patterns that we can identify? To cut a long story short, I think uh, this, this idea of, of treating these as morphemes somehow is very problematic, but the idea of analogy, of course, is very nice. More promising, I think, uh, is Pike's idea of formatives. That comes from 1963. Formatives are more like reminders, basically, not like morphemes. So Bauer says that that's a recurrent element of form, independent of whether it's an empty morph or realizes some morphemes. So basically, it's like a sound bite, more or less. And when you look here at the table at the Middle English pronoun system, uh, you can identify certain of these formatives, so sound bites or reminders of certain things. So you have an, an ordinary formative, for instance, here in the M uh, that's up here, uh, but you also have um, vector formatives, so that defines certain patterns here. So that's the, the, the vector formative of the, of the TH forms, of the the forms. So formatives are definitely one way of dealing with that. And I think these, this analysis of formatives can be supplemented and complemented by a more recent approach from parallel distributed processing. So from psycholinguistics, and this is um, an idea developed by Wickelgrain in the first place, 1969, and then put into practice by Rummelhart and his group, um, the PDP group, and it's called Wickle Phones and Wickle Features. Wickle phones basically are trigrams. So if you have a word like strip, you can break that down into three elements, like that's the, the, the hashtag basically is the, the word beginning followed by ST, then you have STR, TRI, RIP, and IP at the end, and that's the word final hashtag again. So you can take any form, any complex form that you have and break it down into these patterns of three. And as Pinker and Prince say, any given word is encoded as a pattern of node activations over the whole set of wiggle phone nodes as a set of wiggle phones. So basically, they suggest that word processing can happen, can be treated as the processing of wiggle phones, these trigrams. Rummelhart points out that there are certain technical problems with that, uh, and he suggests that we keep the basic idea of wiggle elements, but instead of using wiggle phones, we rather use wiggle features in the computational approach here. And what we get is three phonetic features, one from each of the elements of that wiggle phone. So for instance, if you take TRI as one um, wiggle phone in, for instance, strip, well, that has the wiggle features stop, lateral, and vowel, or voiceless, voiced, high, and so on and so forth. So one element from each. And you can run computational simulations about the processing of words here. And this, of course, is very susceptible to frequency effects. So the more frequent you encounter one of these wiggle phones or wiggle features, or wiggle feature sets, the more likely it is in the future that you will use it again. And we can use that to look at Old and Middle English pronouns, basically the same idea as formatives, but now with uh, the, uh, combined with wiggle features. In Old English, we have the plural forms. They all started basically with uh, the word beginning and H and HI. That is, of course, acoustically slightly problematic because that's not a very clear signal, can easily be misunderstood, can easily be missed. Uh, so that's not an optimal situation. Old Norse then, through language contact, introduced this new Wickle feature set, basically, the, the the interdental fricative uh, in the first person plural. What we then have in Middle English are also the final parts, that's EM and ER. Then we have middle parts, so the Wickle uh, phone analysis here for the middle parts. It's either with the um, interdental fricative or the H. And of course, the first parts, Old English H and Middle English, the modern English forms with the interdental fricatives. 
The point is that as soon as you introduce one of these wiggle phones or wiggle feature sets, this, this one from Old Norse, and you use that more and more often, it becomes more and more likely that, it's, that, that it will get used in the other forms as well, that you see an analogical formation there too. Uh, so this is basically a matter of processing and frequency. So having that in a first person plural obviously increases the chances that the same wiggle feature will then pop up again in uh, the second and the third plural as well. This is something that I would call an expressive action in the sense that this is not, not premeditated, but it's something that um, is basically a psycholinguistic subconscious process that uh, happens when speaker use the, uh, speakers use their language. The second example is for purposive action. So what happens when speakers intentionally and with a goal basically uh, use their language. And this is, of course, uh, reminiscent of what Keller says in certain cases. My example basically is Elvis has left the building. Um, Elvis has left the building is a phrase that was allegedly coined by Horace Lee Logan in 1956 uh, on, the, on the live radio show, show uh, Louisiana Hayride. And he, he supposedly said something like, please, young people, Elvis has left the building. He's gotten in his car and driven away. Please take your seats. Other people say what he says was, all right, all right, Elvis has left the building. I've told you absolutely straight up to this point. You know that he has left the building. He left the stage and went out the back with the policeman, and he's now gone from the building. It doesn't matter what exactly the wording is. The one thing that stuck, obviously, like a meme, basically, was Elvis has left the building. And that was later on also used by other commentators and moderators in Elvis concerts. So El Warren, for instance, used that famously. And it's also even on a recording, uh, the, the famous Elvis Medicine Square Garden concert in 1972 has this famous phrase, Elvis has left the building. That phrase, of course, at that time, when you use it, when Elvis actually leaves the building is fully compositional. There's nothing really spectacular about it, apart maybe from Elvis. It gets more interesting when you look at present day users. So this phrase, Elvis has left the building, is now used in baseball as a comment for a home run. It's used uh, by the Pittsburgh Penguins hockey commentator, Mike Lang, as an expression after Pittsburgh wins at home or in some Frasier episodes in the TV show, Kelsey Grammer says, Frasier has left the building. So it's even playing with the form a little bit there. The movie Independence Day uh, has that phrase when the female lead escapes the spaceship and in, in the credits in Jay and Silent Bob strike back in 2001 they end with Jay and Silent Bob have left the building. Two and a half man the TV show Alan Harper uses the line uh, to let Charlie Harper know that his seduction skills failed because the lady just left the cafe unimpressed and uh, Alan Harper says well Elvis has left the building. After the last crew member left Space Shuttle Atlantis on its last mission in 2011, someone commented on the radio, last crew member is out, Elvis has left the building. And then we also have WWE superstar Shawn Michaels uh, had a quote, ladies and gentlemen, the heartbreak kid Shawn Michaels has left the building. The point is that now we use that phrase variably. So we play with the form a little bit. We can have other people leave the building. Um, but the point is that it's no longer about Elvis. This is really something about that the show is over, that something special maybe happened, that something funny happened, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. And the point is that this is not something that people use unconsciously, but it's really a phrase that people now use consciously with a purpose, with a goal, the goal of being witty or funny in this case. And this is, for instance, a purposive action in language change. Moving on a little bit, we've talked about the macro to micro step. We've talked about the individual action component in its two forms, in the expressive form and the purposive form. Now let's look at the third component, that's the micro to macro component. So how do we get from the individuals back to the system level? And I would like to suggest that here in this case, social network analysis, for instance, is one of these very promising approaches, not the only one, and we'll see others today too, but network analysis is definitely so interesting because it 
uh, starts from the micro level, from the individual speakers and the networks that these speakers contract. Uh, so how does that work? And I would like to start with one example, which is not from linguistics, but from the current COVID crisis. I think that was very fitting for this, this online talk here. Uh, there's a really interesting study on the spread of COVID-19 in social networks, um, which you see here. So you have one social network structure here up in A, and uh, that's the spread that you witness in that network. And then another network structure in B, and you see that the spread is considerably different. And this, this study shows, has to do not with simple social distancing, which is important, of course, but you can reach also a flattening of the curve by just creating different networks. And in particular, what's so important is that the ties between the networks need to be reduced. So it's not having contacts in your particular community, but it's important to isolate that community from other communities. And if you do that, as they show in this study, and they run various simulations, which are absolutely intriguing, if you do that, you see a flattening of the curve. The point is that um, I, I would like to claim that many linguistic features spread in networks like COVID-19, basically. So uh, epidemiology and linguistic change, linguistic diffusion, may have certain similarities here, and this is why social networks are interesting. They are also interesting for Coleman's model, of course, because they haven't been included yet. So what we're looking at here is one community with one language, has a group of individual speakers, individual speakers act in a certain way, and then back to the community. But what this model doesn't have so far is communities, of course, in contact with each other. And that's something I would like to represent with that simple dot here, basically. So you could have contact between the micro level speakers, basically, who then exchange for various reasons, expressive reasons, talk like the others, et cetera, et cetera, certain linguistic features, which are then introduced into the other community. So you don't have languages in contact, but you have speakers in contact. And through these speakers in contact, you ultimately get a social outcome if there is enough individual action, of course. So if, if these features spread then after contact has occurred. The Milroy's, of course, the famous Milroy study on social networks has discussed that at length, of course, and they've, they've shown very, very nicely based on Granovetter's early work that the weak ties are the important ones here. So if you have two networks basically, and there's a weak tie between those, so a marginal contact, if you like, that's exactly the bridge basically that transports features from place A or from, from social network A to social network B. So this is one point where the Coleman model needs to be modified a little bit. Ultimately, what you get is this sort of picture that that's something I talked about a long, long time ago when I looked at social networks. And I suggested that if you start with a new form or function, basically, you need to ask yourself, does it come from an external source or from an internal source? Internal source means it's based on performance or because the speaker perceives prestige or the speaker wants to be funny, but it's not brought to the speaker from the outside. That's the important thing. If it comes from an external source, then the innovator, of course, tends to be a bridge, right? So it's the bridge that brings in the form from the outside. Um, and if that bridge is then in frequent contact with other members, especially the core members in the network, you usually see adoption or you don't see adoption depending on um, on whether the core member also likes that feature and starts using that. So for instance, if you think about Elvis has left the building, if you take that feature and transport it to another community, which doesn't have that form yet, the question is when the bridge uses that new phrase, that new construction, and the core members of the networks don't like it, it's very unlikely that the form will spread, but vice versa, if the core members think that's a cool thing to say, then we see a rapid spread through prestige and frequency in the network. If you stay with the internal pathways, then the innovator is of course not necessarily a bridge, but could be anybody in the network basically, because anybody is probably in the same relationship to the linguistic system with the same constraints, with the same factors that we discussed before. 
Then the question is, does that change happen? Um, or is that change, ha uh, is that noticed or not noticed? If it's noticed, right? So if people realize that something is happening, think about because, think about not, think about Elvis, then the question is, do they see that positively or negatively? If it's positively evaluated, then it's probably spreading rapidly. If it's negatively evaluated, you might still see a slow spread, but usually it dies out. Um, if the change goes unnoticed by other people, so think about the great vowel shift that we talked about. We don't know, but I find it unlikely that, that speakers will immediately notice that their vowels are shifting. In that case, uh, it's either adopted through frequency or it's not adopted because it's so slow, basically. It's not, it's not happening here. What we then notice, of course, in all these changes is the famous S-curve of diffusion. The S-curve of diffusion is, of course, something that, as you saw before with the COVID-19 crisis, is also something that um, happens in social networks and that, that, that we can uh, diagnose here. So basically, any change starts with a few innovators. Then we have the early adopters. And once we pass that chasm, basically, we reach the early majority, then the whole change basically lifts off until we reach almost 100% and there'll always be a few laggards that don't participate. That's the theoretical model, but of course we see that in a number of changes. So here you see the S-curve in sociolinguistic diffusion in early modern England. Uh, so that's on the system level already. So we're not looking at individual speakers or social factors, but what is happening in the community. So we start with a few people who change their word final TH, so singeth for the, the S sings, slow spread. But then at that point, basically we have lift off and the change happens very quickly. That's the point when we see what I call collective action. That's when all people are moving in the same direction. And the same thing for the replacement of um, uh, ye by you. Uh, so again, very slow at the beginning, but then massively when you get frequency effects in the community until, of course, we reach a point in the system, present day English, where you only have S and U, except for very, very special cases like the Bible, for instance, and, and sort of religious contexts where uh, a few forms remain. But apart from that, uh, we, see, we see that the system actually ultimately has changed from a system that had TH and Y into a system that has um, uh, S and U. Last example here, uh, that's also social diffusion in early modern England, the wonderful work that's being done in Helsinki by Tatu Neverleinen and, and her crew and Helena Ramelin Brunberg, who study the, the, the early modern letters um, and personal documents. And again, what you see is an S curve here, but here it's slightly more interesting because you can watch the micro level aggregate more closely because we can break that down into different regions of England. Um, again, it's the S and TH variables, singeth and sings. And you can see very clearly that at first, London and the court was pretty slow. The North was quicker to start, but then at one point right here, London uh, kicks off basically as the city and takes over and takes the lead in that change. And that, that is again something uh, we can call collective action, where again, individual speakers are all marching in the same direction until the system as such has changed. One more current example from micro to macro, and that's a study that I absolutely love. I think it's fascinating. That's micro to macro on Twitter. All the, all the great studies that Grieve is, is doing, um, he's looking at Twitter data and the spread of innovations on Twitter. This is only one example. He has tons and tons of that on his website and, and highly recommendable. The question is on fleek. On fleek is a phrase, I think, that's usually related to, to cosmetics and eyebrows. So if you, have, if you have very accurate eyebrows, for instance, this is the example that you see on the top left. So most of these examples relate to eyebrows. Eyebrows on fleek, meaning that uh, they, they seem to be very accurate or something. But then only like less than half a year later, 
all of a sudden these eyebrow references are gone, but now on fleek means something like uh, being, being the quality of being perfect or being on point. And that's the numeric spread that you see uh, on Twitter. So these are only the references of on fleek, which have nothing to do with eyebrows, right? So you see that the new use increases rapidly over time in a very, very short period. And even more interestingly, when you have geotagging, you can even see that where exactly do things start? Where do they spread? So over here, that's basically solid, right? That seems to be the heartland. And over here, that's the area where things are spreading rapidly. So with tools like that, and here we take social networks literally almost, you can really see how features on the micro level spread from speaker to speaker until you get this collective action and the system changes. And maybe who knows in a few years from now on fleek will be the general English uh, expression for being on point or something. Right, finally, um, my summary and conclusions up to here. Um, I think that Coleman's bathtub or Coleman's boat, whatever you want to call it, uh, can offer us a fairly robust model that explains how macro phenomena in language can develop. So how old English gradually transforms into middle English, gradually transforms into modern English. So it can develop and change. And that's in symbiosis with individual micro behavior. So we're not just having abstract linguistic systems, but we have that in combination with what speakers are actually doing. As far as I'm aware, uh, they haven't really played a big role in sociolinguistics so far, but I'd, I'd love to be corrected here. They don't really contradict in any way uh, what we have so far. They complement the diverse findings of sociolinguistic approaches to change that we've gained over the last ever basically, so perfectly compatible, I think. And they may help us to understand and model the microlink in language, both synchronically and diachronically. So it's, it's not just about change, but it also helps us to see how present day speakers relate to their linguistic communities. They encompass and unify hitherto more disparate perspectives, I think. So we have aspects from the linguistic individual. We have aspects from diffusion. We have conscious and subconscious changes the invisible hand, grammaticalization, the S-curve, and so much more. And all this seems to be perfectly compatible and, uh, and usable, basically, explicable to some extent when we look at Coleman's bathtub as one model. So I think, in conclusion, they may be interested in an interesting model for future research. Thank you. So. Uh, we thank you so much, Professor Alexander. Uh, You're welcome. Yes. And uh, I'm sorry for not being on uh, during the beginning, but I was waiting on the, the Zoom platform, but sometimes it <laughs> doesn't work very well. So I'm so sorry. I, I really did like uh, not a simple task that that was to to briefly introduce your very long curriculum <laughs> and uh, <laughs> i thank you so much for this You're welcome like You're outstanding welcome. presentation um i i i was i have like uh two questions uh, sure, sure. if we can talk a little bit about it and if the the public who is watching have some questions we can uh, you can put the questions in the uh, in the chat uh, so I, I i have one question here so i will make the question of suzanne and after i will make my own okay mm -hmm. so uh her question is does the bathtub not essentially visualize what keller said about the macro is the result of non-intentional microactions, or could you elaborate on the difference and or added value? I think that's a very, very good question. I've been thinking about that for a long, long time because I, I had the same impression that the bathtub is very close to what Keller is saying. But uh, on the other hand, I think that that what Keller is not talking about is ultimately how the system moves. So Keller is interested in 
the macro to micro in the sense that what are the constraints, the, the maxims that he has there. So he talks about that. Then he looks a little bit at those individual actions, but he doesn't really look at diffusion patterns, for instance. And he doesn't really discuss like, how does that ultimately feed back into the big, big picture? So I think in the details, we might find a few differences here, but not many, I think. I think Keller was, was really very, very close with his ideas, yeah. Okay, I'm sorry I didn't I didn't introduce myself. I'm Vanessa. I'm professor <laughs> at yeah University of São Paulo. I work with philology and uh, historical linguistics of the Portuguese and um, digital humanities also. Mm -hmm. So I'm sorry. No uh, and I I was like when you were talking about like this micro and macro relations, uh, it, it made me remember Durk Durkheim, yeah. who yeah. recognized that society was composed of individuals, but society was also more than the sum of these individuals and their behavior, actions and thoughts. Uh, mm -hmm. So the, the society had an existence of its own, Yep. Uh, apart from the individuals, and uh, I was thinking about how the the micro, macro in linguistics uh, mm -hmm. relates to that thought of Durkheim. High, if you can talk a that's little a, bit, that's that's a hard question. Um, let let me think. Um, I, huh. I think that when you have the, in that case, the macro level, if I understood you correctly, would be a little bit more than just the individual micro levels collectively, right? <sighs> yes, m maybe one point that we can make is that the, the macro level is not created intentionally by the individuals. And so this could lead to factors which the individuals have never considered, like the invisible hand process, for instance, right? So I didn't intend to change the lexicon. I didn't intend to change the syntax, but because I want to be funny and I use this post intentional not, and then my neighbor is doing that and their neighbors are doing that. And all of a sudden we have a language that has post intentional not or word order changes and whatnot. So in that sense, and this again could then of course leads to new factors and context for the same speakers and for other speakers who again work with this background in their own linguistic system so it's a maybe the one refinement that the boat needs is that it's not just macro to micro micro works and back again but it's like a continuous exchange between the two levels but what the macro level ultimately looks like is beyond the control may and maybe that's the link here is beyond the control of the individual in that sense, it's more holistic. It's more than just what we have there. Yeah. Okay. And uh, the other one, when when you show it like the the Twitter's spread of the own flick, I yeah. was yeah. thinking about like how do you think, and if do you think that the the digital social social networks can affect or modify the models of linguistic change or not? <laughs> uh, I think they can help us to see them more clearly. That's the thing. Maybe they don't, they don't, I wouldn't, I wouldn't expect the models to change dramatically, but I would think that studies like Reeve and studies of the Twitter corpus and these things, they can help us to trace more clearly how things are, are spreading, how things are moving in society and in space, basically. So it's a, a very nice way of visualizing, simply because I think that the, 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 the spread on Twitter, for instance, mm, is maybe not exactly the same as we see in real life. So when you look at how people use modern data, like Twitter, for instance, or Instagram, they are much more, they tend to be more careless in their language use than they are in real life. So it's more likely that you're 
I don't know, a little bit more funny and a little bit more non-standard maybe on Twitter than you would be in a group of people, for instance. So in that sense, I'm not even sure if there's always uh, a perfect compatibility between the two. Yeah. Okay, and I have a question uh, from Tamara. She asks if uh, the study of language variation and change at the individual and at the aggregate level is becoming quite fashionable nowadays. Mm -hmm. How do you think these new studies fit with within Coleman's model? Oh, I think it's 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 perfectly all right. I, I think when when I think about Peter Pertier's project, for instance, in Leuven. Uh, where he's looking at the, what is the mind bending grammars, right? Where he's tracing individual language use across speakers across time. And I think that's exactly what we need because if we want to further explore Coleman's model in linguistics, we need more micro data, right? So we've only started to, uh, to, to collect micro data and look at it very carefully for a long time. We all know the time when, when it was completely taboo to look at the individual speakers because what the individual speakers were doing was chaotic, was random, was not systematic. So it was all about the system, right? And now we're beginning to look at the individuals more and more and more. But I think it's important to keep the system in mind and to see how the two relate to each other. So in that sense, I think Coleman's model is, is perfect to provide the, the link between what the individuals are doing, that's our new field of study, and how that relates to the to the macro level. I think that's that's great. That's a great opportunity. Okay. So uh, I I I have also asked my like two questions and thank you for answering and the questions of the public also. And I want to thank again you professor alexander for your conference that was like so exciting to to think about like the the linguistic change about social linguistics in a very in a very creative way thank yes, you thank I, you so I, much I, I, I really like it when when you said about like it's a uh, compliment, a complement to to the social linguistics theory, and I I, I appreciate that complementation in science because it, I think it's the way we we can like produce new knowledge. Man, so so I thank you so, so much. You. <laughs> yes. You're welcome. It was a great great pleasure. That was really an honor to be in. Very very exciting. And congratulations to you people for for having that great idea of having the the lecture series. I think that's one of the few really great things that comes out of COVID-19. Yes, and I think we'll, we will not be able to stop that. <laughs> Maybe, I think, I mean, I think it like... would be wonderful, definitely. It would yes. be wonderful to have that in the future. And my students also greatly appreciate that. I mean, all the people they get to see and hear, and they only know them from books, so now they see them live thanks to you. So this is really, that's great. Yes, I want also like to thank Abralinha Ao Vivo, and for this like uh, remarkable initiative of making like this conference and round tables. And Definitely. it's so important to strengthen uh, our area and the community's engagement uh, in the project. And I invite you all that to continue watching the broadcasts and disseminating the series among your colleagues. And if you can say, uh, some words like just to finish the broadcasting, it will be wonderful. Okay, again, thank you so much. I had a great, great time and I hope you enjoyed that too. And if people have any questions or ideas or sometimes it takes a little moment to, to think about stuff. So I, I would greatly appreciate more input because I plan to work a little bit more on Coleman in the future. So if people have ideas, I'd love to hear them. Thank you so much. Thank you. Bye-bye. Bye-bye.